Some some really fresh names on the show today. Yeah, they're, they're not Eric and Michael. People have heard those names. <laughs> those are stale, over tired old names. <laughs> they really are. They uh, really are. But in the spirit of uh, old school, I guess we could say old school Canadian horror. Yeah, is that... old school Canadian horror. Yeah, I don't well, know fuck if it. Was... Let's do that. We I... have two old school Canadian horror movies on the show I'm not sure that you today. can say that. I don't know if Canadian horror was ever a thing. Well, it's a school. it's a goddamn thing now, and and you know what the phrase "old school American horror" doesn't really point so much towards the old school. It also as it doesn't does really the, mean much anymore. It means not a sequel. That's There's what it means. Hatchet too. Out. There's a third <laughs> old school American horror, not a sequel, not a not remake, a not a sequel. Japanese one. Well, people know what we mean. Uh, what are the movies we're talking about? Um, we're doing Jack Brooks' Monster Slayer and Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. Awesome. So both pretty recent movies, too. Relatively, for double feature standards. Which means, you know what? You don't know how these movies end. So you're going to yeah. get spoiled. Jack Brooks' Monster Slayer. Uh, Jack Brooks is going to slay some monsters. But there's something about one of the actors you don't know. It's sad, and it happens. And it's not his death. <laughs> and uh, the the second movie, Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, um, I feel like probably lighter on the spoilers. It's very conceptual. I, you know, more... spoilers are spoilers, man. I know how you feel about the spoilers. I know. But uh, well, what I was going to say is people can use the chapters that are in the show to skip over the movie they haven't seen or uh, otherwise are pretty much finished hearing uh, hearing us talk about. Jack Brooks' Monster Slayer is a film from 2007 and a film that has been on double feature yep, before. We've already covered it, so moving on to Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. Tucker and Dale vs. Evil is a film... F- no, sorry. <laughs> Don't fucking chasing Amy movies off of our show. I'm sorry, I wasn't Can trying to... Can that become a lexicon term to yeah, chase until Amy? until we remove year one and then there's oh, no, no reason. What happens to the lexicon then? Where is year one? Anyway, was it the first Music Box Massacre? Uh, that sounds about right. I'm yeah, trying to remember back. back to the first Music Box Massacre I went to, and I think that's where Monster Slayer was. I think so, too. It was a movie we didn't talk about a whole lot at the time, but man, do you get a lot from the, the crowd reaction oh, on yeah. that one. It's um, Not the least of which is making fun of how Canadian people talk. Right. <laughs> well, I feel like the movie, it's, you know, when we talk Tucker and Dale... It's a so-called Canadian American horror uh-huh. film. I had no idea it had any where roots. Use, in... Where you use um, actors from the northern parts of America. Yeah, you use the cheap actors and you film it. And <laughs> I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Um, when I think about Jack Brooks, though, I feel like I have to. You almost have to mention Canadian in the description of the movie. Yeah, as if that's one of the things. Obviously, he's slaying monsters, but also there's Canadian stuff happening. Yeah. Jack Brooks has to save his Canadian school from certain destruction. Or um, Canadian plumber Jack Brooks has to... I, I got nothing else. Well, and, and I think the other important part is some random flashback. Is that in Canadian? Is that in a Canadian jungle? Is that part I, of the plot? That's exactly what that is. Okay. Yeah, Canadian jungle. I haven't been there's, to Canada, so I don't know what the Canada. jungles... There the are jungles no jungles like in there. Canada. Okay. There's a lot of uh, a lot of unexplored space in Canada. A lot of <laughs> uncivil. They only have one fucking city, and it's Toronto. That's it. It's the only city in Canada. They also only have one expressway, and the show only uses one kind of hyperbole. Okay. But yeah, you're right. There are no jungles in Canada. Before we gloss over them, because I know this is going to happen, John. I think his last name is pronounced Knots. It's uh, K N A U T Z. Sounds about right. He did second unit for Chillerama, and that's all I know about him. What he's, is the, what, what is, he's the what director is the, in this oh, okay. film, I was so I guess what I know his two relevance things. Was today. I know two things. That's not true. He, I mean, this is his first full length film. Mm-hmm. So when we were talking about Fresh Faces earlier, uh, that's going to be the case for both of these directors. He also did something called The Shrine in 2010. I don't know. Did, that have you seen that? Sounds familiar, but I haven't seen it. No. Yeah, the poster looks fucking freaky. I don't know anything about huh. The Shrine. So we're seeing uh, we're seeing somebody who's brand new and might have a lot of space. Although it's been quite a few years since 2007, right? But not so, as many since 2010. It's still hopeful that he's going to have a ton of stuff coming out. Sure, hopeful that he'll have the career that Robert England had. Yeah, Robert England. It it seems like he's come up a hundred thousand times. Well, that's because he does show. come up a hundred thousand times. Just, just in the in second, Killapalooza. Yeah, I think that's he true. came up that often. <laughs> 
Uh, well, so there was that one. Which Killer Blues was that? Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. So Robert Wish England. Master? Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Only the first Wishmaster, not the uh, not the rest of them. It would have destroyed some kind of cosmic principle of horror if he had actually been in all of the Wishmaster films as well. Although they booted him out of the Nightmare films. Biggest yeah. mistake of that. Man, that killed uh, remakes for me. Yeah. I was totally in on the remakes until there was no Robert England in uh, the new new yeah, nightmare. You need you need one of our famous Roberts in the remake in order for any of us to give a shit, right? <laughs> Whether it be Zombie Rodriguez or England, sure, yeah, it's got to be one of the Roberts. He uh, so he played Freddy Krueger. He played Freddy Krueger for a long fucking time. He did, if I remember correctly. He even played Freddy Krueger in the New Nightmare. He also TV, played whatever Robert what? England in New Nightmare. Oh, so I keep saying <laughs> New Nightmare. Uh, I meant Freddy. What is what was it? Freddy's Nightmares. The oh yeah, the, Freddy's Nightmares. Then if uh, Freddy Krueger was even in that show, um, <laughs> I'm trying to remember back. Then Robert England play, played uh, Freddy Krueger. But yeah, in A New Nightmare as himself and as uh, Freddy, not the only time we've seen him on the show. Also behind the mask. Yeah, uh, Hatchet. great part in by uh, Hatchet as well. Yeah, Hatchet. And then 2001 Maniacs. Yeah. Uh, probably even more than this. These are oh, yeah. things off the top of my head, but um, a horror, a fucking horror legend really oh, yeah. is and deserves every little bit of it. Yeah, he's, he's really one of the few actors in recent history who have just become an icon of horror. Sure, sure. There's really nobody acting that screams horror. Maybe... Um, Maybe in the new wave of somebody like Sid Haig. Oh, yeah, yeah. He kind of screams horror now. Well, it's weird to think the new wave of Sid Haig and then think, you know, we saw him in, uh, what was the old exploitation movie we did with Sid Haig? Foxy Brown. Coffee. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, Big but, Bird Cage. Yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. Right. Yeah, but recently, because of the zombie stuff, everybody's picked up on him as the, you know, the horror guy. Although there were definitely horrific things about the Big Bird Cage. <laughs> Robert England, um, my favorite part about Robert England in this role, but uh, even more so in his horror stuff, is if you know a little bit about the guy or you've seen him a lot, you know that he can fucking act. Yeah. For as little as I know about acting, I know a few things, and one is that Robert England can do an awesome job at all sorts of different roles. He's got a lot of versatility to him, and he plays... He can be the straight over guy. Over. He can play the terrifying guy. He can be the comic relief. Sure. He can direct. Yeah. He can pretty much walk onto a set and improve the film. Yeah, right. Just by being there. Yeah, but... Apparently, he can do slapstick. Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So, you find these things out about him, and then you realize... He's not one of these guys who's cast as, you know... He's not Gilbert Godfrey, who sure. you put in a movie because he's Gilbert Godfrey. Right. He's not somebody who, yeah, he's not a Bruce Campbell perfect example for horror, right? Um, Bruce Campbell winds up in horror movies because you want Bruce Campbell in a horror movie. A lot of horror actors aren't great actors, but they're in a lot of horror films because you recognize them and you're excited about them. Robert England, I feel like, could do almost anything, and he still is in these horror films. Yeah, no, that's exactly how I feel, is that he is one of those behemoths of horror, but only because he chooses not to go out and be in the next major Oscar award-winning film. Yeah, he yeah. could be that. <laughs> he could be any type of actor, but instead he kind of just orbits the horror community yeah. and bounces back and forth and supports the hell he does. out of any up-and-comers and anybody involved. He and does. Anybody who has any ambition in the horror community. It seems like from the uh, from the times I've seen him interviewed, and, you know, he shows up in these documentaries and stuff, too. He's very well-spoken. He reminds me of Michael Emerson when I've, mm-hmm. when I've heard him talk. Just very quiet and calm and knows his fucking background. Yeah. He is so different in this role uh, because he's not playing... He doesn't have to do anything sinister in the first half of the movie, right? right. He's just this geeky chemistry teacher and he's doing that so well it's so enjoyable to watch i mean i'm just fucking smile every time he's on the screen mm-hmm. you know you can't possibly not be having a great time when you're watching him get, i i believe that he could be giving chemistry lessons and i would be glued to it right uh, generally a fan of chemistry anyways but you know what i mean <laughs> he you could show up to any class he's doing i would want robert england at my driver's ed class you know what i mean yeah 
So it's not just, oh, I've learned the skill set of being a sinister villain. I'm going to be in all these horror movies because that's where I excel. It's I'm going to work in this particular genre, maybe because he fucking loves it so much. He yeah. really does appear to. And uh, and then he plays a chemistry teacher here and he's brilliant. He's just great. The slapstick stuff, too, when he first makes that turn and he's uh, he's sort of just a, a zombie, you know, a mindless drone yeah. wandering around, bumping into walls. And he's basically moving around like a fucking Roomba. Right. Yeah. And then he goes back to teach his class and he's eating chicken and he's hobo Robert and he's disgusting. Just perfect in every scene. He brings with his own kind of sense of foreshadowing in the, um, in the movie. You see him in these different scenes and you think, well, he's got to be the villain. He's Robert England. Sure. And so you're waiting. It, it seems like every time he disappears from the room, I wait for him to come back with a weapon. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. He's always going to come back in the shadows and stab our protagonist to death. Right. There's that scene where Jack's working downstairs and, um, and you know, he, Robert leaves him alone. Robert's character leaves him alone. And when it finally cuts to what he's doing upstairs. He's like shadily sitting on the steps. Playing with his dog. Yeah. He's playing yeah. uh, with a rope toy. Yeah. But his yeah. I, it's it. I feel like. When I see that, I'm always like, what is that? Is that a rope toy? No, that's a bone. That's a human bone. That's right. That's skin. Right. See? You're thinking, well, what creepy thing is he going to be doing? Well, when you catch him, you know, all alone, he's playing with yeah. his dog. He's fucking playing with his dog. The music is another one of the things I noticed shortly after that, that, um, again, I kind of had this first impression of it, and it changed my mind a little bit. It starts like it's going to be just for laughs. Yeah. You get music in a couple of these scenes and it's so overdone uh, on purpose. It just has these moments that are, you know, like there's one liners built into the right. score. And then you get the part where he turns and suddenly the music has this, uh, this sense of kind of wonder and amusement and exploration. Like, uh, like something strange and magical and fantastic is going on when, mm -hmm. you know, he's turning into a, a fucking yeah. monster. And that's about it for Robert England. I mean, once, um, once he turns into that monster, that's all for the actor Robert yep. England anymore. He, he, we becomes, don't... he becomes a Jabba the Hutt slash rock biter hybrid from sure, yeah. the Slither. It's a combination of a lot of different... It's a classic movie monster. Yeah, it really is. For a uh, a film that, you know, pays tribute to a lot of the classic mm -hmm. stuff, a lot of that kind of John Carpenter, the thing, sure. you know, sort of stuff. The the stuff with no CG, you mean? Well, I was going to say the stuff with Death Curse, but yeah, we should oh, talk. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the Death Curse guy I think first. the Death Curse is great in this film. Uh, the, it's what's Howard yeah. at the uh, hardware store, yeah. Hardware store clerk is your Death Curse. <laughs> And uh, I, you get Alzheimer's death curse, which right. is the best. The fucking greatest idea for any film is Alzheimer's death curse, where you warn somebody about the death curse, and then you come back and see that guy the next day, and he doesn't remember you. Yeah. And then you tell him where you're going, and then immediately he snaps back into death curse. Sure. It's like you're at some sort of haunted house, yeah. right? <laughs> it's just the... Uh, the motion every, sensor? Every time you take this ride, it reacts the exact yeah. same way. Yeah, I love that. I love that it's in a hardware store. I love that he's a fucking clerk. Um, you know, as he's giving his death curse uh, spiel, the guy shows up in line. And yeah. <laughs> eventually goes, hey, I can't wait all day. He literally has to stop delivering his death curse, uh, you know, his dark, scary death curse performance to ring out a pack of nails or whatever yeah. the fuck the guy is buying. And then they come back later and it's still... Beat for beat, same yeah. scary thing. And then it's followed by a weird story about how his uncle ate a heart. Yeah. So that's a heart eating. Well, so heart eating obviously reminds us of uh, a previous film we've done yeah. in another franchise. Not in another the Freddy franchise, franchise. Another film, another hotter. Another Voorhees. That's fine. You can say that. Um, callback, you think? I, you know, How often I, do you eat a, a fucking black heart in a movie? I don't know if it's a callback or if it's just a fortunate device. Uh, I, I hesitate. The... No, here's why I hesitate okay. to call it a callback. Right. If it were Friday the 13th Part 1, uh -huh. callback. Sure. Friday the 13th Part 2, maybe callback. Friday the 13th 3D, you're getting into <laughs> you're dubious pushing territory. You're pushing Friday it. the 13th Part 4, the final chapter starring Corey Feldman. Okay, maybe. Jason 9? Yeah. No. 
No, not a callback. Nobody's call calling back to Jason Well, it's kind Jason of a tribal thing, to too. You eat the heart yeah. or whatever, or gain the Nobody's power. Nobody's calling back to Jason Goes to Hell. We're calling Jason back to... Jason doesn't even call back to Jason Goes to Hell. <laughs> right. He goes right, to hell, fine. and then five years later is in space. Is there it... is no callback to Jason Goes to Hell. Point taken. I'm convinced. That being said, they both eat the hearts in both films, and uh, it's Disaster equally ensues. hilarious either, yeah, either right. time. It doesn't result in CGI, though. No, uh, you're right. CGI. No CGI in the movie. And I love it. Yeah, there um I mean, you kind of have to do that in a movie like this. You know, it's really pushing the boundary of being a tribute film. I don't look at this and go, "Oh, it's a tribute to all this old stuff." Sure. But I feel that because of the CG or the yeah. lack of CG. Right. You know, when we talked about Slither, you'd mentioned Slither. Um we saw some similar types of effects yeah. that were done in CG. Not once did I think, oh, John Carpenter's The Thing. Sure. Or think back to any of the 80s classic monster stuff or think back to The Blob. Sure. Uh, well, maybe I thought back to The Blob a little <laughs> bit. But you know what I mean. I didn't think, oh, this is a movie that's championing the old stuff. Right. You add practical effects to that mix and bam, instantly. Yeah, no, I, I guess I, I do Oh, this I do is a guy who that. loves the old monster right. stuff. And he's doing, I guess because when you love the old monster stuff, one way you show that, I mean, James Gunn does too. Yeah. We knew that when we saw those movies. Uh, even when you see something like Super, you kind of sure. know that. But one way you really demonstrate that is by going, you know, they had fun doing these things on the set. I'm going to have fun doing those things, too. Yeah. You see that in Rob Zombie stuff. Yeah. You see heads cracking open, that's and you true. absolutely know, oh, that's a there's a fucking paper mache head or a Cronenberg head or whatever's right. going on there. It's because Rob Zombie likes the old stuff. Yeah, I just, I always feel like there's this this line that you can walk about just deciding i fucking hate cg i'm not gonna do cg sure sure and i worry about people falling into that because if you look at something like rob zombie he uses cg in the most tactful ways. oh sure um i but, don't feel like there was anything that blatantly needed yeah, it though. that's what i was just gonna say is if you have a film like this where you don't need cg something again like the thing where right. the cg is just unnecessary sure then yeah it absolutely becomes this kind of great mentality and a callback to the old school you yeah know, right really, right the old school well if you're gonna generate uh computer stuff i mean maybe you don't need an excuse to do that but i've taken this it, it kind of works the other way i guess i've taken this approach to watching a lot of these practical films now that are done by you know rigid fundamentalist practical effects guys yeah and i've kind of gone okay well what scenes might i have used uh cgi for and how would that have, you know, would that have been a better move in any of these scenes where you kind of shoot yourself in the foot by mm -hmm. going, I'm only going to use practical, I'm swearing off CG. And this is one of those movies you can watch and I really don't see any area. I mean, what do I know about how effects work day in and day out, right? I don't know what they cost or how mm -hmm. they're done or whatever. But I don't see anything that I think stylistically, I go, oh, that's a rubber thing. It would have been cooler right. if it was a, a CG thing. Sure. Kind of wonder what Robert England would look like if he were a CG monster. <laughs> but I also kind of don't. <laughs> I also kind of fear that. I love when his uh, creature deflates. That's yeah, one of my that's, favorite I love parts that. of that. Head explodes, creature deflates. It just seems like one of those things that's natural for you to do sure. if you have a prop. Well, that, that follows the scene of ultimate slaying. Yeah. For the former portion of the film, you get the former portion of the title. Uh, you get Jack Brooks. Yeah, he's and got then, anger issues. You're building his character. And You're building as, his fucking character in a movie like this. As the latter, as the film progresses, you get into uh, a little bit more of the title, and you get Jack Brooks, monster. These are <laughs> right. what's going on in the film. Oh, look, some monsters. And then in the last 15 minutes of the film, it's just Slayer. What a beautiful idea. The entire time. What a beautiful it's idea. Just, it's And it's great because you know how it's going to pay off. Mm -hmm. He's had all these rage problems you know the title sure you've probably seen the cover yeah. you know the poster the cover whatever oh no one's no one's confused or surprised yeah. by what's gonna happen but by the time he finally starts i guess putting his rage to good use you're shouting use the chair yeah right. you're shouting use the chair <laughs> right you know what i mean you're excited about it's, it it becomes this thing that you it's just a visceral ecstatic reaction sure, it's the crowd pleasing brutal right brutal violence yeah yeah it's those uh midnight movie kind of crowd pleasing scenes when you have an audience and they're shouting it's, yeah oh god it's great this is you know i'm so happy you brought that up because that was the last thing i had written down that i really wanted to talk about 
we've mentioned a lot of the stuff in Jack Brooks that's cool, but my favorite part is that this isn't, oh, he slays monsters, we're going to see him flip out every couple minutes. Yeah. A lot of times it's a great choice, and there's no fault to a movie for taking that. But this movie saves all of the violence and all of yeah. the action for that end part. So by the time it happens, I mean, it's not like you've been bored through the movie no. going, oh, when, when are they going to slay monsters? Well, you like the characters. I mean... You do, yeah. And it's fun watching invested. Robert England be a crazy guy. Yeah, absolutely. It, you would have been paying tribute to the action just for the title. That's not important. You don't need to do that. So you save that for the end. And then basically, that action happens. Man, it's fun. There's no warning to it. It just comes out of nowhere. And after about two minutes of it, you go, oh, uh, this isn't stopping. Is yeah. it? This is the action part of the film. We're just going to keep killing fucking monsters left and right until they're all dead. Until right. every single one is dead. And that's how we resolve our conflicts. So uh, Tucker and Dale versus evil. Is uh, it's a this is the first time I saw it. I'd heard so much about. Oh, you it. hadn't seen it before. Yeah, I just oh, heard that's great. Tons and tons about the film. Um, I didn't even know that. And um, it's new. It's it's fucking brand new. Twenty ten. Yeah. yeah. And uh, well, and Eli Craig. So another. Uh, I mean, this is you know first major film for him. He was an actor before. He did that uh, weird Clint Eastwood um, space cowboys. Really. And he acted in Carrie Two. Wow. Um, but yeah, I hadn't done a lot of stuff, even acting wise. And then out of nowhere comes this movie. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I want to talk about all the humanism stuff and the sure. skewed perspective thing and all that. But um, Alan Tudyk. Alan Tudyk is the uh, Robert England of sci-fi fans. <laughs> <laughs> no, I believe that's actually Nathan Fillion is the sure, Robert England same franchise. of sci-fi fans. Look, yeah. I just used the word franchise. Everyone's going to be really happy by that. Wow. Same TV series that had a movie. Yeah. We can call it a franchise. Well, yeah, I, there's it's toys. Me wrote a comic book. That's yeah. Um, so Alan Tudyk was Wash in Firefly, yeah. um, yeah. and Serenity, which totally we did on the show. different character. In that. Um, he totally was, different character than his other. St I have to yeah. mention Dollhouse. Oh, I know you still haven't Dollhouse. seen Dollhouse, yeah. but it's uh, also a completely different character for him. And uh, again, you want to make that Robert England comparison, the versatility of uh, oh, just great stuff. Well, he was uh, Steve the Pirate in Dodgeball. Don't also, know if you remember also that. Also true. And then he also, also true with good friend of the show, Joel David Moore. That's true. And uh, and also uh, he had an arc in um, the show V, the remake of that 80s oh, show. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he was he was pretty good in that too. Yeah. It was early. It was early on in the show, but I mean, you, yeah, he can do anything. But the thing about Alan Tudyk that is consistent, just like Robert England, is the fucking charisma. I think it's the eyes. Sure, sure. I think it's the eyes and and his eloquent delivery. I mean, even sure. in this film, he's the smart one that talks to people. Right. You, that's because that's where he. <laughs> that's where you put him. Right, but not the charmer of no. the two. Dale is kind of the charmer, and Alan's uh, character is. Uh, he's scary. He is scary. So he can also be really fucking scary. He gets and, stung early. Uh, he can just look scary as yeah. fuck. And he's funny. He's also yeah. pretty consistently funny in everything I've, I've ever seen him in. There's just something about him. Um, I feel like he has kind of a comedy background because when I see him outside the genre, it's usually in, you know, stuff sure. like dodgeball comedy stuff. Um, death at a funeral, you know, that kind of thing. With Martin Lawrence? I don't think he was the one that was in both versions. Oh, oh, you're thinking um, Peter Dinklage. He's the uh, he's the carryover actor from both. Death and I love funerals. that you've seen <laughs> Martin Lawrence Death at a Funeral. Had not seen uh, Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Yeah, sorry. The premise has to be talked about here, even though it's really obvious, and that's the amazing thing it does is that you can't miss it. But it's uh, it's so simple and clean and just astonishing. So this group of kids. Goes on vacation in much the same way we've been talking about all goddamn year on, you know, horror movies. Group of kids goes on vacation for a uh, weekend of pot and premarital sex. We love premarital sex. And while they're on vacation, they encounter some scary hillbillies. Killer Sur hillbillies. Can surprise, we please call surprise. them killer hillbillies? Well, that's debatable, Michael, if but they're killer But I want to call them killer hillbillies because that's what was written on the board in Cabin in the Woods. Yeah, no, that's uh, <laughs> I'm into that. I like killer hillbillies as a genre staple of Good. an enemy. We're just going to keep using that for our yeah. uh, the titles they wrote of our monsters. Down. They've done the study guide for yeah. us. Well, they encounter these hillbillies that may be killer hillbillies or cannibalistic hillbillies. I mean, it's, it's right. probably the same thing. Um, we could be doing deliverance again here. Yeah. In fact, I feel like we kind
kind of touched on this idea yeah. a little bit. Nobody ate anybody in Deliverance. In, uh, well, we talked about this a little in Deliverance, and I think we talked about it, uh, if I remember, all the way back to 2001 Maniacs. Yeah. About uh, being afraid of Southerners the for South, no the particular South reason. A, it's a vast, dangerous place, and you can never tell how backwards a person is yeah, until so you there's, actually spend some time with them. Well, there's something not quite right about these two. But to be completely fair, that's the same with anything. It's just we're not from the South. And the right. South always gets portrayed as being backwards, and they always walk up to you holding scythes. Yeah. I mean, that's the weird part, is whenever you're in the South, someone's got a fucking sharp object. Right. right. It's true, though, because I've, yeah. I've been to New Orleans many times. Everybody's carrying something sharp. Sure. Just, they're just carrying it. Well, it's because they work for a living. They do that's things exactly with their hands. That's exactly why it is. It's, it's exactly the reason. They it's don't have precious curly hands They're hardworking, like responsible do. people. Yeah. And it makes sense. Without the city infrastructure, yeah. you know, here everything is outsourced. You want something done, you hire 100 people to do it. There you want something done, towns are smaller, you learn to do a lot of things right. yourself. I mean, no, I don't think that's a stereotype. I think that's a, a product of it, the environment. Well, it, see, that's the thing is it, it falls into what the movie's about is it's a misunderstanding. We see everybody walking around with knives, and our brain could could go one way. Ah, oh, these are hardworking people. Or it could go the other way. They must stab everyone. <laughs> right. Well, that's the beauty of it. So we've set up this fucking camping trip that we always have. And then uh, the movie says, well, what if these guys are just normal, though? And everyone is still right. afraid of them. And so it shows things from their perspective. It's almost like uh, Behind the Mask, where you see yeah. the behind the curtain and in front of the curtain sure but there's the curtains an accident yeah it's right an accidental curtain <laughs> right well behind the mask we're dealing with what it appears to be and we're just getting behind the scenes of that uh, here we're looking at the other perspective for a reason that reason being things are not what they seem mm -hmm. not in a spooky scary music kind of way but in a no no seriously this isn't this there's been a misunderstanding here and the transition's great for that because the movie opens uh, it, it's basically started the page for you when you're writing this idea. You just start it the way these movies always start, except when they stop the fucking gas station, you don't leave with them. You're mm -hmm. done with them. You have left the survivor group and, uh, and now you're staying here in the more interesting place. I mean, it's asked the question that movies don't ask often enough. You find yourself in a scene and you go, well, where's the most interesting place to be? Yeah. Uh, let's stay here at the gas station. With the fucking weirdos. Sure. That's far and away the more interesting oh, yeah. well, place to be. I mean, we've seen time and time again that the most boring characters are the ones you follow in a slasher film. Yeah, right. The ones you're excited to see are, you know, Freddy, Jason, Chucky, right. Michael Myers. The, you get excited when they show up because you're tired of dealing with these 18-year-old sexually frustrated sure. people. Sure. And you're, sometimes, you know, you want the, the, you know, the dynamics different. Yeah. Uh, you want the monster to appear out of the closet. But could you imagine briefly... A Friday the 13th film where you never leave Jason? Well, it's like that uh, robot chicken sketch. Oh, yeah, sure. What does you, Jason do on, uh, yeah. on well, the other days when, of the it's, year? It's, you know, it's, it's Thursday the 12th, and he's all excited, and then he, you know, puts on his mask and starts, sure. and then it shows him slaughtering a bunch of people. He's having a really good day, and then it's Saturday the 14th, and he <laughs> right. looks back longingly. It's a great spot to be. It's a great place to put your movie. And so we get into the uh, the clever misunderstandings, and that's, I mean, they're fucking funny. The news junkie is probably, I know it's an early one, but it's one of my favorites. Yeah. Here's all the scary newspaper clips, still shot like scary newspaper uh -huh. clips, except for the last one. The last one shows both the scary newspaper clip, but also a coupon. A, a coupon. <laughs> and you've been looking at all these clips and going, oh, there's the scary stuff. And you kind of get the joke. And then you almost feel like a bad person with the coupon at the end because you were staring at the fucking scary thing right. and not paying attention to what, you know, what these nice people have been. Mm -hmm. I, almost as if for a second you might think, oh, the house is haunted and it's going to make them kill and whatever. Yeah. But no, they're looking for the coupon. Later, they become uh, really almost frustrated asking why these kids are acting yeah, so I fucking crazy when it. they're around. I love, I think one of my favorite parts in the entire movie is when they start explaining to the cop oh sure yeah what's gone on yeah and you sit there they explain it you've seen it happen sure and you go you guys are fucked yeah this right. is horribly i don't believe you i watched it i don't believe sure you. sure <laughs> they seem so calm about it and you you keep thinking back you play this mental game as you watch the movie 
trying to imagine it as a horror film Mm -hmm. and going, okay, well, in this moment, if I hadn't seen the other stuff and I was just with the kids behind the tree watching them say this stuff in that context, I mean, would I really identify with them or are the kids too scared or what's going on? You do that over and over throughout the film. And the thing that... Even though you're so on their side. The thing that I thought was brilliant is that toward the end of the film, the fucking, uh, I don't know, the leader of the kids... Yeah, he's got the this kid whole... who's from uh, or should be from Scott Pilgrim, but yes. isn't. He looks like one of the Scott Pilgrim yeah. villains. He's got this whole "we've got to stop evil" thing yeah. going. Yeah, and I'm just like, dude, get off your fucking cross. Sure, Jesus Christ. But I'm sitting there, and if I flip the roles, he's my favorite character in every slasher movie. Sure, the one who buckles down and goes, "We need to take this right, motherfucker." Right. Uh, the uh, Freddy too. Sure. Yeah. Um, and Freddy, Freddy three with the dream warriors, you know, yeah. he's a dream warrior. Yeah. In this movie, I just want him. I'm like, dude, take a fucking chill pill. I know. Calm the hell down. I know. Isn't that great? Put the ax away. It's just a huge exercise of yeah. perspective. It's oh, fucking brilliant. Well, and that's great too, is that he sticks to his guns the whole way sure. to the end. He never, you know, makes a turn. He's always the righteous one. You just know that he's wrong. Well, he's almost always the righteous one. I believe there is no truth. Everything lies. Everything's lies. Well, yeah. That is a that is a definitive moment in losing your humanity. Well, you get to this point of, I mean, as human beings, we always look for confirmatory evidence. Sure. You can't, uh, I mean, you have to blame him for it because he goes on a fucking killing spree. Yeah. So there's a point somewhere where there's blame. But think about the scene um, where two of the other survivors are coming in. And they see everybody drinking tea. Yeah. If you just walked into the movie right at that point and you could kind of stand back and really um, take an unbiased view at, at what's happening, you would go, oh, yeah, they're just drinking tea. Everything must be fine. Let's wander in and introduce ourselves. But at this point, they're so invested in their premise that they have, I mean, they're only looking for evidence that confirms sure. their premise. So they basically go, I mean, the girl even says, oh, they're just drinking tea. And then they kind of pause for a moment and um, they just have to blatantly lie to themselves to go, well, no, it's they're evil. Something bad must be going on. It's not, oh, they're drinking tea. Should we challenge ourselves and rethink our premise? It's, oh, they're drinking tea. We must not understand the the context of what's going on. Let's just head in. Some pretty evil tea. Yeah, (laughs) right. (laughs) Right. Suddenly they're really twisting things. It's really hard to take something you've known as uh as truth for so long yeah and stop and go is it time to reevaluate you know my entire worldview right but that's something so instead you go i i don't know evil tea i don't get it let's keep moving <laughs> yeah but but that's something that the the sheriff is willing to do sure which i give the movie a lot of credit for because well, that's, that's his job that's yeah and that's a movie where it or sorry that's a point in the film where it twists back yeah and you because the film has set itself up for the cops not going to believe them sure Cop walks in and in a completely objective way goes, I believe you guys, but you're still going to get slapped with manslaughter. Sure. That's right. going to happen. Yeah. That's how the system works. You were around people dying. Oh, what a good thing to say about a cop, too. Yeah. I mean, because he's got to be an investigator. Yeah. Especially small town like that. Sure. Smaller police force. He really has to get all of the clues and he's totally and ready to is, go in there and do that. Not only that, but this is a cop who may have previously caught them doing something he doesn't condone. Yeah. And he still walks in. Sure. And instead of going, those faggots must be killing people because they're <laughs> right. faggots. Right. He asks them what's going on, looks at them like, do you think I'm an idiot? And they go, no, this is really what's happening. Well, and he hadn't been swayed by the Texas Chainsaw Bees. Yeah, think, Texas is... Chainsaw Bees. Well, he hadn't seen the Texas Chainsaw Bees. That's always enough. to that, That'll that scare a truck driver to just drive on down the road if you don't re- if you don't recall. So it wasn't until watching this with you uh, <laughs> this time that I caught on to what was happening there. Yeah, saw uh, that. That you pointed out that yeah. it was the... So what what's going on in so the scene? So there's a scene where Tucker is... He's sawing a log. Sure. And there's a beehive. Yeah. And he comes running toward the kids with the saw right because he's being stung by the bees and he comes around the house with the same billowy smoke that fucking leatherface has every time yeah, yeah. or um uh, caroline williams does in the end of the second film sure but and he's he does the spin and the the yeah. saw dance from the texas see, every time movies. i see this i just think he's being crazy because i forget 
that there is a saw yeah, dance. A saw dance. My mind has somehow blocked that out. I can't let there be a saw dance because yeah. it didn't make sense. Now it right. makes sense. There's bees. Yeah. That's why you have a saw right. dance. Yeah, no, exactly. There must have been bees. You almost believe it so much. You want to go back and check Texas Chainsaw Massacre for bees. Yeah. It's ridiculous. But, you know, even that can be explained away. If Dale's a nice enough guy. He instinctively tells them to turn the safety off. I mean, yeah. these guys are constantly reconfirming that it's just a misunderstanding or even uh, even proving, you know, especially in Dale's case, just what a fucking champion he is all the time. Well, yeah, I mean, I feel like Tucker's a little more the misunderstood. Let's show, you know, the audience how you might misunderstand. And Dale's the more let's check back in with Dale and prove how awesome and, and nice these guys are. Remind you what they're like when they're not just I around think, being misunderstood. I think what it is, is that Tucker is the he's the actual southern hillbilly. Right. And the college kids are the actual horrible college kids. Sure. And then we have the couple in between of Allie and Dale who are a little column A, a little column B. They're the lines are blurred. They sure. can gel better. Sure. Good. But call. I think that I think that Tucker is just Tucker is to the college kids. Right. What Dale is to Allie. Sure. He's just so much in that vein that he can't gel the way that Dale does. Yeah, I mean, if there's anything unbelievable about, uh, you know, in terms of spooky or scary, it's how well those two fucking get along. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's true. great. It's the college teen and the the so-called, uh, I guess, self-described, what is he, dumb as a log, I think he said. Yeah, something like that. Uh, dumb as a stump, yeah. um, kind of outdoorsman. And they're talking over this board game, and it's so fucking natural. There's no awkwardness. They both have things to say about each other's lives and what they're doing. And uh, just kind of showing how two human beings from completely different backgrounds can relate mm -hmm. when they're just sitting around chatting. Another thing I like about Tucker and Dale is um, not just this perspective switching kind of thing that's going on, but also the uh, they're playing on kind of mini cliches in horror movies, too. The. Um, when the cop first comes in, they have what would otherwise be a hamster style sure. and does end up being a hamster style too. Uh, hamster style being a reference back to orgasmo. It's you bring something up seemingly arbitrary early in the film and ends up being a huge fucking deal later in the film. Yeah. And, uh, we use the term loosely, but here somebody leans on a beam and it just kind of goes, Whoa, don't lean on that beam. Spikes might hit you in the face. Anyways, let's go back yeah. to what we were doing. And then later hits the cop and, yeah. and becomes, a, oh, I remember that from the beginning. But they make you forget about it. Um, not forget in a way you won't get it later, but they make you, you don't go, oh, how is that going to come back? Sure. Because they use it for a gag the first time. Yeah. So Dale falls on Tucker. And this is right after the scene where the cop catches them in the car. So instantly, you know, you go back to, oh, it's another gay joke. Sure. They had the beam swing. Why the fuck is a beam of spikes swinging in this movie? You don't have to ask yourself that. You see why. It's yeah. so one can fall on the other. Ha ha, funny joke. Move on. Right. And then when they lean on the beam later, you're not spending the whole movie going, who's going to lean on the beam? You're going, oh, fuck, don't lean on that beam. Yeah. And then it happens. Right. So it accomplishes both. There's um, another a really subtle one when Tucker gets knocked out. And um, I don't even know if this was the intention, but... The next scene after the kids knock him out mm -hmm. starts out of focus, uh -huh. and it could start out of focus because the the very typical thing to do after a scene where someone gets knocked sure, out is to have them come to and have their show how eyes fuzzy they're. Yeah, yeah, you got it. So you're picking it up too. You get that point of oh, view yeah. shot, oh, yeah. and you just show everything's blurry, and then it comes back into focus. But instead, they go for another joke. Um, you just haven't seen where the depth of field is yet. Yeah. You don't. You have not seen the point of focus in the shot. Until he swings back in upside down too, which is a great little, again, just reading into it as a comment on that scene. Swings in upside down. I, I don't know. It's just funny. Yeah. And there's the, the end thing too. We talked about. The thing where um, the, the hillbilly knocks a woman out like a caveman and drags him off, drags her <laughs> off to his weird oh, hillbilly cave. Yeah, no, not that cliche. Although that's in there too. Uh, no, the kid with the blue shirt. I mean, oh, yeah. you have um, the really the villain. And this is something that you just don't see in these movies the villain ends up being someone from their survivor pack sure that's not uh it's never done in a way where you know who it is sure it's always pull off the mask oh my god it was todd 
Yeah, and there's still a reveal about his uh, his hillbilly genetics. But it's but which is funny. It doesn't change who he is. Yeah, you're right. You know, it's blue shirt kid who's gonna be yeah, the, the whole crazy time. villain. Yeah, there's no uh, there's no who done it kind of mystery here. There's no there's no somebody with a jacket is running around killing people and they pull right. off his jacket and he's wearing a blue shirt. Sure, there's none of that. So instead, we've taken a character and we've shown how we see his story arc. We know how he's become a villain. He didn't start out the movie slaughtering people left and right, but there was escalation. We saw his flawed premises and how that led him to be a villain. And how, you know, how a villain becomes a villain is something you and I are pretty interested in. Yeah. That doesn't, you know, it doesn't happen a lot in movies. Right. You don't often get to see that because it's a very, I mean, it's usually a pretty long story sure. arc. But also, it's just not a story a lot of people are interested in telling. I think a really interesting story is... How do good people or normal looking people anyways make terrible fucking decisions? Right. What better movie to show that in than this one? You know, we get the joke about the misunderstandings, but I think that uh, it accomplishes more than just the jokes, which are there and are good. But on, a, on kind of this really intellectually pleasing level, it says a lot about uh, the disagreements people come upon. Or the thing that Ali says, right, about how the... Um, a great number of the world's problems could be chalked up to miscommunication or whatever she says. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously what the movie's showing us too. But we're getting that exercise. We're getting that, well, here are different pieces of miscommunication that could lead to that. That's how this kid becomes a villain. You know, in addition to uh, the fact that he's willing to take lethal measures, he sees these bits of miscommunication here and there. And you can do the mental exercise of going, well, what would have stopped this? What would have fixed this? How could we have maybe assumed some positive intent here or there instead of jumping towards, oh, these people are killers? Yeah. And then you ask yourself about, well, thematically or, or cinematically, I guess, uh, what are the different elements that contribute to that in a slasher movie? Which says a lot about the chemistry. So um, I'll back up a step. Something like music. Mm -hmm. You look at a totally normal cabin in the totally normal woods. The totally normal Canadian jungle. A remote cabin, not spooky, right? Nothing spooky about it at all. You or I could go there on any day and find something that a lot of people find scary, not scary. Right. And we might ask ourselves, you know, what, what do people find so freaky about this? The straight story, right? Exploring yeah. a lot of those kind of areas. Sure. Not once did we watch the straight story, except maybe during those early creepy yeah. David Lynch scenes. Somehow, during the day, totally fine. At night, scary. At night one day, totally fine. At night another day, wow, this is really chilling. How does that happen? And music is one of the ways. You sure. know, you play with the ambience of that, and uh, you add a little creepy music to something, and people get a little creeped out. It's just all well, context. It's because it's, it signifies that it's supposed to be creepy. Sure, And then sure. you wonder why it's creepy, and what's right. going to happen. So a lot of when someone walks down into a basement, and they think, oh, this basement's dirty, or they think, oh, this basement's good for a party, or they think, oh, this basement's, you know, warm and fuzzy. Uh, the differences there come into maybe the context of the day or, the, or their situation, but usually what's going on in their head at mm -hmm. the time. Some people walk down into a basement and think it's super fucking scary. And I'm really interested in what elements kind of make people think those things. Because those same elements, at the end of the day, are going to be things you pack into a horror film to make it subtle, but still really fucking sure. scary. It builds atmosphere. Uh, so speaking of nice, heartwarming little places you can go, uh, doublefeatureshow.com will warm your heart to... It certainly will. It's very core. Don't eat your heart. Bad time to eat your heart. Right. Um, if you do feel like eating your heart and you need somebody to talk to, some sort of counselor, sure. doublefeatureshow at gmail.com will forward that to our trash bin. And, um, oh, come on now. If it's good, we'll read it and not respond instead. Yeah. <laughs> That's Hey, send an email now, and at the year end, your email <laughs> may be read in a brief synopsis that we interject uh, into. It, I mean, it's October already, so the year this year is already a quarter of the way over. I meant our... I was going to say fiscal year, but our show would have to make money for that. Yeah, to, that's... Uh, nope, not calendar year. What's the thing I want? Uh, two more films, I think. The end of our, looking for. <laughs> our show run. Not even halfway. Oh my God, how do we do these? Uh, whatever. All that means is that I have more than halfway to go before I have to suffer through another terrible year-end yeah, episode. Fuck that. Why do people like those? All right, anyways, uh, two films that yeah, are happening we're gonna next do, time. Um, we're going to do Orphan and Insidious. Watch no, more. No, no. Watch more fucking film. Oh, right.
Bye.